Okay, thank you very much. Um, you know, guys, I'm very happy to be here. Um, uh, the wonderful organizers of Podium uh, invited me to uh, to do a little workshop on, you know, on how do investors, uh, first of all, how do they look at good ideas, how do they find them, um, the whole correlation between ideas and investments. Um, it was supposed to be a workshop, but this room is, you know, I've, I've probably never spoken on such a big stage before, so it's kind of, it's, it's hard to make it interactive, uh, but I'm going to try. Um, and basically for me, there are two topics in this whole thing, investors and ideas. They're very different, but let's see how, um, at least in my experience and the experience of many people that I work with, how do they cor correlate, you know, to make it easier for you guys to, to, to get into the brain of an investor. Um, basically, the, this is, you know, this is the big idea. How do you get an investor to say, you know, shut up and take my money right now, right? How do you, how do you get to this point? Um, let's start with, you know, what investors are. Um, how does one become an investor? Um, you know, my own story is, um, is like this. It started actually with, with this. Um, for those of you who don't either uh, don't speak Dutch or don't see the small letters, it's a foreclosure notice. Uh, you know what a foreclosure notice is, right? It's when your apartment goes for sale. This was my apartment. Thankfully, it was not my own apartment. It was a rented apartment, but my landlord got in trouble and, and the apartment was foreclosed while I was living in it. This was a photo taken from my balcony of, of the wall with a foreclosure notice. It's quite embarrassing to have this on your apartment <laughs> from the outside. This happened as a result of lowering the rent, which we did with my partner, uh, who became my partner, a friend from university. Uh, we figured out that in, in the Netherlands, where we lived and worked, uh, there was a legal system that can use some disruption. And we started doing like small legal stuff. First for ourselves, we got a parking permit for two cars in downtown Amsterdam, where you could only have one. And we found a niche in the law, and it was like basically one simple application. You paid 20 euros to the city council, and you can get an apart uh, a parking spot, which otherwise would be completely impossible. And private parking spots, they cost like 500 euros a month. So we did that. Then we figured out that we could rent the, um, we could lower the rent of the apartment which we did, and our landlord went out of business. He had to sell the apartment. Thankfully, in Holland, when they sell the apartment, you still get to, you, know, you can't kick out the tenant, so we were, we were good. Um, long story short, we started doing this for more and more people. Um, we set up a legal agency, you know, who, who started, you know, giving, giving, giving a hard time to, to landlords and to, to the city of Amsterdam, and everyone just started having, you know, two cars instead of one in the street. Long story short, became an online law firm. I sold that, and, um, you know, at the kind of at, at the end of my time with that company, um, I I started going to Bulgaria on holidays very often to this region to southeastern Europe, and I had this like big idea, sort of a vision, like this is a very very good place to build companies, and if I'm going to build a new company, I'm going to do it in a place like Bulgaria. Um, life happened a bit differently, so I moved to Bulgaria, but in the end, um, instead of actually building a new business, um, I joined an investment company, Eleven Startup Accelerator. Uh, last summer I left that, and I'm currently raising a new fund. But basically, if you, look, um, if you look at the logic, if you get inside the, the brain of an investor, uh, you can see certain reasons why they do, you know, why they do uh, the things they do, why they invest. Um, and it always has to do with what they did before or the kind of money that is behind them. And understanding those is very key to understanding how investors think. Um, I don't know if you see, if you see this, guys. If, can anyone read the text? It says, I call my invention the wheel, but so far I've been able to attract any venture capital. Right? So this is the kind of situation you don't want to happen to you. Um, looking inside the brain of an investor, um, there are basically a couple of things that, that you should always um, pay attention to. Uh, first, first is the workflow. Uh, you know, when you're looking at investors, um, you can see, you should ask, you know, where are they in, the, in their workflow? Uh, do they have a fund? Is it private money? Where does the money come from? How many investments have they made? How many investments do they make per year? Uh, sometimes in investors invest not only money, but certain services. Those are the things you've got you know, you to understand in order to, uh, in order to, to fully assess, to fully assess uh, that investor's probability to invest in your company. Um, a very important thing uh, when looking in the brain of the investor is also that investors basically invest in two currencies. You know, they invest with capital, with money, but much more than that, actually much more valuable, is the connections that they have. Be you know, as I already said, investors usually come from a certain background. They have uh, they have industry contacts, and they they look at, you know, they they look with together with those industry contacts. They look at what can they do for a certain company. So the intros, the 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 partnerships that an investor can give is is what really matters. And no investor is the same. You know, that's why like in every business, in the investment business, there is space for a lot of different investors because in the end of the day, nothing you know, no no business, um, uh, no business is the same. Um, 
technology. You know, I, this is a question that, that I get asked a lot. Um, uh, is, is, do you guys do only IT, you know? Um, as you probably know, Paul Graham from Y Combinator already said it very well, much better than I could ever say, uh, software is eating the world. You know, technology is important. Uh, technology automates manual processes. That's why, in the end of the day, venture capital always invests in some degree of technology. And the more technology there is in something, generally, the better it is. So that's why, you know, that's why we, we love engineers, because engineers are the ones that can actually produce technological products. I'm going to make it even simpler, um, and I hope to go like, really quickly through these slides. Um, if, you, if, you, if you have to remember four things you know, about investors and about how dealing with them, just, just make it those four. Everything else is less important. Number one, investors, and this is where we come to the idea point, investors don't invest in ideas. Ideas are very important, we'll come to that, but investors invest in execution. So when we look at an opportunity, all what really matters is the execution, you know? Uh, the more of it, the, the more execution you can show, either, even if it's a very, at a very small level, the better it is, right? So when we look at, a, at, you know, at an investment opportunity, if there is just an idea, it's really, really hard. Uh, if there is already some kind of prototype, that's something. If the prototype has users, that's something more. If the users are paying money, Bingo, it's almost a business. Whether it's a sustainable business, different question, but it's, it's execution. You show that you can actually execute. Number two, this is very interesting. I don't know if you, uh, if you know this thing. It's a project, ma uh, project management triangle. Um, uh, th th this is used for software they, or, or, and hardware, by the way. Um, information technology products. That, you know, they say that something can be fast and good, but it won't be cheap. If it's cheap and good, it won't be fast. Uh, and if it's fast and cheap, it won't, it won't be good. So it's, it's always two of the three. Um, with investors, we always look at three things. It's team, market, and traction. Um, ideally, you have all three of them, but then you're a very you know, successful company, basically, and it doesn't make any point for a venture investor to invest. Um, you know, if you look at Apple, yeah, definitely. That's a company that has an amazing team. They attract the best talent. They, they have a great market, and you know, we all give you know, pretty much a very big chunk of our money to them, um, and they have very good traction. They sell you know, hundreds of millions of phones and tablets, et cetera, et cetera. Um, a startup, won't have all three. But the question is, how do you fill that cup? So, so what is really important for an investor is, you know, for everything that you lack in team, you must be able to make up in market and traction. It, so it, let's imagine if, it's very, if the market is really hard, but you have great traction and your team is awesome, that's something the investors want to see. And conversely, if your team is not that good, you know, it's, that's actually, <laughs> actually a bad idea, but imagine you're, you have really great traction and the market is awesome, well, that's, that's a risk that an investor can take. So this is, this, is, uh, this is the second thing to remember. Number three, and this, this is something that I mentioned before, um, investors are middlemen. So basically, um, in the end of the day, you always take money from someone and give it to someone else. You know, investors, uh, so someone said it this morning, uh, I think it was Rob Fitzpatrick, they said that investors are the judges of the future, that, that was extremely, you know, highbrow <laughs> explanation. Uh, I, I, I can only hope that I, I might live up to that one day. Uh, but basically what happens is that you spot opportunities which you know you can sell later. You sell them in only two ways. Acquisitions or companies become big and go public, which means that all of us uh, become investors through our bank loans, our pensions, our mortgages, etc., etc. So, so it's, always about, you know, it's always about buying someone in one place when it's still small and selling it in a different place. Um, and, and this is a logic which you should always keep in mind. So, um, for instance, if you look at London, um, you know, a lot of startups ask me, for instance, should I go to London? You know, is London a good place to move? And if you look, for instance, at the venture capital scene in London, um, what you see is a, yeah, a big amount of funds, but the vast majority of those funds, if you look at where they raise their money, it's very often American money, um, and it's a, very good, it's a place where generally American interests look for European companies that they can invest in. And I once asked, um, a, a friend of mine recently raised a fund mostly from uh, money from ex-Googlers that, you know, that worked at the company. And I asked him, so why are you, why are you in London? Uh, why don't you, why, why do you go where everyone goes? He says, well, that's, you know, why everyone is in London. Uh, they speak English here and there are a lot of flights. You know, if that was the case in Paris, they would have been in Paris. So understanding, you know, the logic behind the investor and his fund is really, really important. Number four, final thing, um, in venture capital, unlike in public markets, it's all about insider trading. So this is a really cool thing, you know, uh, about being a private investor. There's no such thing as stuff you shouldn't know. It's all about insider information. In our case, this means that the, um, the, strongest, um, the strongest credential you can have as a company with an investor if another company of that investor introduces you. So basically, if you're, if you're looking for intros, that's like the, 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 probably the most, you know, gol golden tip golden piece of advice that I can give. Get introduced, 
by one of the entrepreneurs or companies that the investor already invested in. If, if you can make that happen, it's really, um, it's, it, it hap actually happens very rarely. But, and, and when those intros come in, like we did with my new fund, we did four investments. You know, it happened already once or twice that uh, one of them introduced someone else and said, hey, that's a company you guys should look at. Uh, that, that, is really, that is really valuable because, you know, be, um, first of all, we know each other very, very well. Uh, secondly, they have skin in the game, I have skin in the game with them, so for them it's quite, you know, it's quite valuable. Uh, if that intro is not good, they really lose credibility, and so do I. So, so those, those are very, very good intros, insider trading. Before pitching, a couple of things that you should do. Um, first of all, study the investor. This, you know, th this is the very simple you know, type of homework that can be done by everyone who wants to talk to an investor. So, you know, it's, for every investor, you should be able to find all the deals that they invested in. And usually, not always, but usually also the terms of the deals. But at least the companies and their CEOs. If you can't find them, that usually means that's not good. That's either the investor is not legitimate or they haven't invested at all. So figure out, before you go to an investor meeting, figure out what they have done. Talk to all of their investments. That's something that I would do. If I would be raising money, and I'm actually currently uh, raising money for the, for the initial closing of my new fund, um, you know, I want to talk to all the people that they invested in. So I, I make that list and I just call them and, you know, how are they as an investor? What do they do? What do you like? What don't you like? A very good way to, um, to figure out. This, by the way, this is the uh, funny photo, but this is the guy who invented the mobile phone. Uh, I spoke to him three weeks ago at some other conferences. <laughs> very inspiring. 86-year-old guy, you know, he, he runs faster than me. It's amazing. Mirror image, if you can, talk to, their, to, to the fund's investors as well. Now, this is not always possible. Um, in, in many countries or in many situations, funds don't disclose and shouldn't disclose who their investors are, but sometimes you can find it out. Uh, it's always worth asking, who are your investors? And if, if you actually have the, the gut to, to call up uh, a financial institution that invested in an investor and say, hey, how's that going? How's that investment going? Because we want to take money from those guys and we want to know if it's, if it's legitimate. That's a really strong thing. You know, you really, you really Set yourself, you know, out of the, uh, above, above the crowd if, if you do this. And, you know, final thing, someone, um, someone said this yesterday, I think, uh, I think it was in a private conversation, not on stage, that, you know, every, everyone says, uh, if you ask for advice, you get money, and if you ask for money, you get advice, so, you know, ask for advice and then you'll get money. Uh, and it's a gimmick, so it's kind of blah, blah, but to be honest, it's really true. Um, I, I, found it, I find this, um, you know, this worked for me and for many people that I know very well. Um, uh, advice is free, and investors generally have a lot of, uh, because you know, we keep a macro view on stuff, we, we often see small stuff that you might not see, you know, as they say, you don't see the forest through the trees. Uh, so if you go to an investor and you actually ask them for a piece of advice, that, you know, that puts you on the map, that's a dot in the relationship, and generally very good. So that's something that I would always, uh, would always advise doing. Obviously not all investors feel like giving advice, but those of them you know, that I respect, and I, I'm trying to be one like that, uh, we're just excited about entrepreneurship. So if we hear cool ideas, always more than happy to give you feedback on them. So how about ideas? You know, and this, is, this is the initial thing. Um, uh, we don't invest in ideas, I already said. We invest in execution. However, ideas are really, really important. Um, uh, there was a blogger that I, uh, that I respect a lot. He used to be a financial writer. Uh, right now he has a really popular blog. His name is James Altucher. Uh, he has a couple of like, really uh, cool ideas about ideas, which, which I like very much. Um, first of all, and this is something that I'm trying to do more and more, is that every time you have ideas, and generally if you, if you, think, about, you, know, if you think a lot about something, you get, you get a lot of ideas. You have ideas about your work or about the startup you want to do, write them down. And with, for every idea, you know, write down 10 steps that you need to take, the 10 first steps to realize them. And if you can actually do that continuously, I, I started doing that a couple of years ago. I, I still don't do it as, as much as I should, but it's sometimes really cool to look back in your, in my case, it's Evernote, I keep everything there, and to see you know, what you thought about certain stuff and how you think, you know, what you thought you should do about it. And to be honest, like a lot of the, a lot of the things that I find successful, which I did or I'm doing, they, they came out of, you know, of this, kind of, uh, this kind of exercises. Um, the second thing is that, um, I, I, the second thought that, that James Altrisher had was, um, you know, the idea muscle is like, every, is like every muscle in your body. If you don't train it, 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 it atrophies, it, it, it stops working. So it's really important to actually train your idea muscle. And, you know, this framework, this is, you know, very simple stuff. It's like, uh, you know, in Dutch, they, we call it uh, kitchen, uh, kitchen, um, kitchen tile wisdom. You know, it's the kind of, kind of uh, corny stuff that they put in kitchen tiles, you know, which, <laughs> which you can put as a, as a quote somewhere, but it's really true. Um, if, if you generate a lot of ideas, you might actually generate a vision. 
You know, uh, when I was uh, when I was still in Holland running my company, um, I really had I was really thinking really a lot about you know imagine I would move a part of my operations to Bulgaria, that would be so awesome, you know. And then you know I had these naive ideas. I thought like all the other startups in Holland that I know, we could actually all like together like set up like something like a summer camp in Bulgaria. You have a lot of it's seaside, great food, a lot of cheap you know local people that are enthusiastic about working. And we could really do something, build up something like a startup community. To be honest, it. Now, now I understand that was a vision, and looking back, it sort of happened, but in completely different ways than I, than I imagined right then. Uh, but if, if you general, generate a lot of those ideas, you can actually come up with a vision. When you have a certain vision of the future, that's when you can actually start building small, so kind of zooming back in and, and building small versions, you know, the next steps of what that future eventually should be. Um, once again, it's not me, it's Paul Graham who said this. He said, like, if, uh, if you really want to know what kind of things you should build, it's you just go to the future, come back and build what's missing. So in a way, in a very abstract way, that's, that's, that's pretty much what it is. Um, and, and basically, um, there are a couple of examples that I want to share with you, and then maybe, maybe some, some people want to ask questions or, or give me feedback on this. Um, one of the things that I found most inspiring, one of the stories uh, you know, with startups that I, that I uh, recently uh, recently was a witness of, which I found very inspiring, was um, at Pioneers Festival last uh, October. I don't know how many of you, how many of you were at Pioneers Festival in uh, in October. Do, do you guys remember the the girl with the uh, wheelchair? Does someone remember that? Uh, sorry. Yeah, there was so in the big hall. There was this uh, there was this girl. She was in a wheelchair, and then she stood up. So they were they were showcasing this technology. So this company is uh, they're called Exo um, Exoskeleton, I believe, or they make these exoskeletons. I think the name is also Exoskeleton. Um, they have a vision basically that um, at some point exoskeletons, which you attach to the outside of your body, which are powered and they can keep you in balance and they can make you walk, uh, at some point they will be so uh, commonplace that we will be actually able to use them when we grow old. So you know, imagine your grandma right now who's let's say 90. God bless if, she, if you have a grandma that old. And you know, she really has a hard time walking, but with an exoskeleton, she might actually move much better. Uh, in reality, that technology is still by far, by far not developed enough to do that. And it's so expensive and so hard that your grandma will never, or her health insurance would, <laughs> would never be able to afford that. So what they're doing right now, they, they basically made um, several minimum uh, viable versions of that product. The first one was for the army. That's very often how it starts. So they use it you know, in, uh, for, for soldiers that are dropped in enemy territory and that have to walk 100 miles in a day. You know, they wear these exoskeletons. And right now, they started using that technology for, um, for people who are, uh, who are um, immobile. So people who have had an injury, um, spinal cord injury, can't move. Um, and they're now testing the first version of that product with those people, allowing them to make still, you know, very small steps. But it's magic, you know. And in the future, at some point, this is something we can all use if we're tired or if we're old and can't move anymore. Um, and that is a company that really has, you know, they have that vision and they're executing a small, small version of that of that vision. Uh, so basically, generally, you know, this is, um, you know, in a in a, in, a, in a nutshell, uh, how you go from an idea to uh, a crazy vision of things down to stuff that you can actually execute on, then you start executing on it. That's when investors smell interest. That's when they look at the team that you have, you know, at the traction that you booked, at the kind of market that this first version has, and um, that's, that's when they invest. A much more mundane uh, example, you know, this is an inspiring story, but much more mundane example in a way is Microsoft. If you look at the history of Microsoft, we all know it because so many books have been written about it. Um, there's this great movie, Pirates of Silicon Valley, which is especially funny to watch now, if you know the movie, because um, it's an old movie, 1999, and it ends with you know, Microsoft being really good and Apple like, being basically no one. And <laughs> if you look now, it's, it hasn't turned around, but it's getting there. Um, but the story of Microsoft is very similar. You know, The guys had a crazy vision. Um, uh, or in the beginning, they actually absolutely didn't know what they were doing. Then, at some point, they got a vision, um, and the vision is that you know that they would build software standardized that would allow anyone to be much more productive than they were. Uh, the first version that they built was a small operating system which didn't work well, and there was no software for it. But they managed to sell it. Uh, so, so that's how it starts. Um, make something, make something small, doable, um, credible that you can actually make it, and then things go well one by one. You'll get to uh, first an investment, which is the easy part, and then to actually <laughs> making great product that's worth um, worth distributing. Um, this is actually it for me. Uh, I don't know if there are, are there any questions or are there other stories that people would like to share that you know that where we can discuss 
uh, in terms of with ideas getting to 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 market to investors. Yeah, is there? Um, will we have microphones? Okay, cool. Thanks. Hi. Uh, the question is: uh, uh, First of all, I heard once uh, Dave McClure saying you should never uh, pay too much attention to investors. Mm -hmm. uh, investors should be paying attention to uh, to you. Mm -hmm. So, like the other way around of what it normally looks like, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's. I would like to know what you think about it. And the, uh, the second part is startups, new startups. Should they be thinking on the interests of the investors first or what? Um, uh, so about the second part, I don't really understand. Yeah, so what, what do you mean thinking uh, about the What I mean is I've seen so many new startups uh, saying, no, this idea would not be good for investors. So mm -hmm. uh, it's better that, yeah. do you understand? Yeah, yeah. Well, so, so, um, so well, let me answer the first part. Um, uh, in terms of not paying attention to startups, uh, there's a lot of truth in that. So, you know, once uh, I fully recognize what you said, and I, I remember it very well from, from the times when I was, um, you know, when I had a small company and we were raising seed capital. And in, in that time, this was in Holland in 2008, 2009. Um, there, was, there was absolutely, there were almost no angels. There were definitely no seed funds locally. There, there were only like old, you know, big VC funds that invest in very mature companies. So, uh, so I remember that, you know, finding investors and running after investors and, you know, having this feeling that, you know, for them, they couldn't care, but I care and I need to, <laughs> I need them to notice me. Uh, in reality, when you're doing this work, un unless you're doing something very wrong, it's, it's the same for you. Like, I have this very strong feeling that I need to find companies that I might want to invest in and I have to convince them to allow me in. Actually, the best you know deals that I'm talking about with 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 founders are the ones where you know I have I'm I'm building a relationship hopefully that will allow me to invest in that company and there will be many other investors wanting to get in but I will get in because we have a certain relationship so 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 from that point of view well, McClure is right anyways well, you know <laughs> disrespecting what I think about him or not but uh, but but I fully agree this is exactly how it is and it's it's you know I think it's it's the result of like maybe a hype, maybe it's because it's a new thing that everyone is talking about, that there is this perception that investors are some kind of, you know, like gods or something and that startups have to like pitch to them, but it's, in reality, it's the other way around. Like, there are a lot of smart people and we should get the opportunity to invest in them. Uh, so, uh, regarding the second part of your question, um, if, if you could, re you still have the mic or? Uh <laughs> so, th I've seen many startups yeah? trying to build up their uh, uh, business models thinking from the perspective oh, yeah. so, of the investor. Right, so whether you, whether you should, uh, th that's not good. So, um, I mean, theoretically, obviously there are cases possible where if you, if, if, if you have a certain skill set and an investor gives you some ideas and you conform that, the skill set into the ideas that you get, but uh, something that I see a lot is, um, you know, the very early stage investment field is very standardized, so you have a lot of accelerators nowadays that have very standard, you know, demo days, and they, they all look at sort of the same stuff, and we all, you know, read the blog, so we know what kind of technology is hot, and I, I, I've, I've seen a couple of times that, you know, um, also when, we, when I was on myself on the investment panel of, uh, of, of our accelerator in Bulgaria, uh, that people would uh, come up to us and say, like, yeah, but, uh, um, yeah, we didn't get in this time, let's say, but then next time we'll actually do what the other guys did with the same idea because that's something that you like. Now, that's, that's stupid, of course. That's stupid. But unfortunately, there are some, there probably are investors uh, that, 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 that encourage this behavior. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Speaking about investors, there is this saying in, um, um, in the, in the, asset management industry. So asset managers are usually the people who professionally invest in investors. So that's where VCs go to take their money from asset management funds, from wealth uh, management funds, from pension funds, et cetera, et cetera, where asset managers basically allocate the, the, the money that goes to different sort of investments. Um, asset managers, they have this saying that VCs uh, of all asset classes, so you know, like obligations, banks, um, of all the asset classes that they invest in, uh, VCs have the highest asshole per dollar ratio. <laughs> so that's what people say. It might be true. There are, there are definitely bad people in the industry, but there are a lot of good ones as well. So. <laughs> any, any other questions? Or? Uh, yes, please, if I can. Um, actually, I need one advice, and I have one question. Um, 
Uh, let me start with a question. You were mentioning team, uh, mm -hmm. that the team is very important. And whenever I talk to the people, they say investors invest in team. Mm -hmm. And I can agree with that because my team is everything to me. And I think that the people are the ones who build the company and you are as smart as the people you are around mm -hmm. uh, you. But uh, if I believe in my team and you have like, I don't know, uh, half an hour to talk with my team and uh, maybe they had a bad, bad day or, or something, mm -hmm. how can I convince you that they are really something that I I believe in. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's a very good question. See, we, we repeat that all the time and, and to be honest, team is, is really, um, it's, it's, um, it's a collection of things. So first of all, it's obviously the, the individual in the team and, and their personal skills and histories. It's also very much the, um, the way the team interacts. So is there, uh, is, is it really, a, is it a strong team, right? So is it a, is it a group of people that, that really work together as a team? Um, is, is the atmosphere good? Um, you know, if, if you look at pitch decks that companies send to investors, very often if there is a if there, if there is a photo of a bunch of smiley people that are kind of engaged in a fun activity together, that usually gives you a first you know hint that it might be a good team. Um, not always. It's very easy to trick, of course, with something like this. But to answer your question, the best thing is to to, to do a live meeting. Um, like for instance, if you take um, just from my own experience, if you take a Skype call with a startup you haven't met in person. And you know you've been emailing with a guy CEO usually, um, and you get on a phone call, and there's suddenly this whole group of people, and they're all waving into the camera. That's that's cool, you know. So so if, if you can do some, if 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 you don't have the opportunity to do a physical meeting, you know, get with the whole team on Skype and uh, try to be natural. Okay, great. And but one it, and it, uh, just to finish this, it's all really about building relationships. So um, this is something I I, uh, I said I think yesterday or. or <laughs> maybe I didn't. I don't remember. Um, it's uh, you know I investors they. Um, they, they generally don't invest in dots, they invest in lines. So, so every interaction is a dot, and if this line is going up and to the right, this is a, a methodology uh, by Mark Suster, a famous investor in the US, then you sort of have a, uh, something, a relationship worth, uh, worth investing in. Uh, and the advice that I would like uh, uh, you to answer me, uh, it's actually connected to the question before. Um, uh, I'm looking for the investment, but I'm looking for the investor, uh, the mm -hmm. person. So um, you said before that uh, you have to know the background of the investor. Mm -hmm. And uh, okay, I did my homework and I found a couple of people that I would like to mm -hmm. approach. Can you give me advice? How can I, uh, I approach a specific uh, person if mm -hmm. I don't know them? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, so as I already said, you know, the best investors. This is what I what I said when I mentioned in, in, insider trading. The best uh, the best intros to investors are those that are made by people that know that know them, and the best ones that know them are actually their investment companies. Um, you know, what I what I very often advise uh, advise people when they ask, you know, what kind of investor should I pitch to is. Um, Make you know, make a, start making a list with for your industry. This is this is how I usually do it. You you know, in your own industry, start seeing all you know all the all the companies that are doing something. Start with the big ones, the famous ones. See who whom they are buying. You know, who, which are the companies that got acquired by them. See who were the people, the founding teams of those companies that were acquired. There, most of them have made some money. They might be angel investors, or they're probably working at this new big company and have a have a decisive role there because you know they got acquired. See, you know, if, if you do that for a certain industry, you'll probably very quickly get, you know, a list of 100 or 200 names. Then go on LinkedIn, check, you know, if you have common, common acquaintances with them. If you, I'm, I'm sure that, for instance, if you connect with some, some of the people that are at, at this event, you will already that massively enrich your network, right? So, so that kind of stuff. And then just, it's, it's in the end of the day, it's very much, a, I guess, a sales process. You, you can connect to a lot of people. Many, most people will probably not answer or not be helpful, but, this, this, this is the way that I would do it. Anything else? Uh, yeah, yeah, I have. Uh, hello, my name is Maya, and I have, I have maybe very unusual question. But would you invest in a book if the topic would be like very good business idea? Mm -hmm. If the topic has the same value as a good business idea, so would you see it as a business or an investment? <laughs> I've never, I've never had that question before. Um, you know, the, it's, it's a very good question, actually, uh, in the sense that it's, it's a tricky question. Um, uh, I actually happen to have a couple of friends who, who wrote books. Um, by the way, Ash is sitting over here. He's a writer of a famous book. So maybe after that, you should, you should you, after I'm done, um, I'll ask you to comment on this. But uh, I have a couple of friends um, who, who have recently published books that were actually successful. Um, in, in vast majority of the cases, and almost always when it's a first book, I've noticed, when it's, especially when it's self-published through Amazon, let's say, which is in the US, a lot of like business books get 
self-published nowadays. Um, very often it's marketing for that person or for the company that he's working for. Um, and very often the first book is actually given away for free to almost like, like let's say 90% of the readers so that you know, a lot of you, get, you, know, you become visible on Amazon and then your second book will start be being sold for money. So, so uh, I would find uh, investing in a book really, really tough. On the other hand, there, there is um, the Kickstarter model, the crowdfunding model is used more and more for books nowadays. So, so you, this is something that you can try. But uh, generally, from a, from a venture perspective, investing in a single title is, yeah, it's, 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 it, it won't bring back a return. But uh, I wonder what Ash, uh, I don't agree with do that. you have a mic? Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, would, I would completely agree with that. And I would say that, I mean, if it's, if it's a business that you're going to build around the book, then that could be something you pitch. So the book becomes maybe a channel, but it's mm -hmm. part of a bigger story. That makes it maybe an investor play. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of books, you know, a lot of books get written for marketing purposes. So that that's one angle. But if it's a pure book, then publishers in many ways are really serving as that investor. They give you a royalty advance, and you go away, and you know, then you get royalties after that. So all of that kind of stuff and crowdfunding definitely mm -hmm. a, a good option there. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, there are definitely the examples of J.K. Rowling, right, who didn't have money and wrote a book for her kids, and she became extremely rich with it. But uh, that, that's a business of its own. It's, 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 it's different than a business book, I would say. Anyone else? Anything? I still have eight minutes, guys. Come on. <laughs> Damian? Yeah. yeah, sorry, Max. <laughs> uh, it's a question not necessarily for you, but... Uh, because you said that you have to like, give some something to the VCs. Because they're like normal people; they want some goodies to, so you get a relationship. So having a relationship with you is easy, obviously. But like, what are the goodies you can get to the investors, like on Twitter or ask for advice? Mm -hmm. Like, what other stuff to get that relationship going? So it's not spamming. Like, yeah, no, yeah, you should you should never spam. Um, yeah, once again, from my own experience. Um, mm, and someone said it today before, I think it was Kiara, the, the, the lady from Fast Company uh, who was on stage, you know, Twitter is really, really a good, uh, a good channel because on Twitter you have public conversations. You can jump, and they're all public, you can jump into every single iteration of that conversation. Um, I've had situations when, um, you know, I, I would see someone, you know, who's very famous, let's say, who, someone who has like hundreds of thousands of followers on Twitter, and like instinctively I'm just reading and I'm like, oh, that's not true, and you just write it, and then you go like, oh, why did I expose myself in such a stupid way? You know, everyone is going to see it now. And then you get a reply, you know, it's, and that reply may be positive or negative, but that's how you engage. And uh, if, if, you, if, you manage to, um, uh, if you manage to engage in that conversation, like more than one tweet, let's say, then you, that, that, that might be the start of a relationship. And if after that, yeah, after that, imagine you've you've had a you've you've had that conversation. If if you add that person on LinkedIn, this is by the way following up on your question. Um, a vastly underused resource uh, is is LinkedIn, and especially it's, it's the box where you can fill in how you know that person, uh, because you know LinkedIn makes it very hard for you to cold connect. You should know that person, which is good logic basically. You shouldn't connect to people that you don't know. Uh, but in that box, like imagine you've had such a conversation on Twitter and you, uh, you have to explain how you know that person. Then you can say, hey, I'm the guy who answered your funny question on Twitter. And uh, I think, you know, I, th I would like to show you something. I'd like to ask for advice or whatever. So that's, be, um, you know, there, there's a Jewish expression, um, be a mensch. You know, it means like be a good human being. Uh, that, that is something that, you know, for me personally, um, although I have Eastern European origins very much, I was born in Russia. Um, I, I find that, especially after the U.S. and after the living in Western Europe, kind of lacking in Eastern Europe. You know, people are generally have a hard time being nice to each other. Uh, very often, people look at each other and, and 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 already presume that that person thinks badly about me or something. Which, in, you know, you should take that away with 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 good humor and very kind of good good attitude, even if people are bad to you. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Anything else? Probably a lot of people entering the room for the next speaker, but we still have a couple of minutes. Any remark or so? Oh, yeah, someone um, in, in the back over there in the middle. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, I have a question. Yes. Um, when investing, uh, how often, if at all, you make, let's say, irrational uh, decisions, like the data is telling you, go away, but your gut feeling tells you this is going to be big. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. It's it's the the essence of uh, you know this is the nature of the investment process. Uh, you have it's always gut feeling basically. Uh, you, then you look for as many arguments uh, as you can find to to make it you know an, an educated guess, but it's still very much a guess always. Um, that's why in, in most firms you have partnerships, and even if it's individual angels, they very often syndicate deals together. So you talk to other investors that invest together with you, and you try to convince them. Uh, but it's 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 always you know it's in a way it's always like this. Um, if it was a clear cut deal, it wouldn't be a, it wouldn't be an issue. It wouldn't be a question whether to invest or not. And and usually it you wouldn't invest anyways because it would be already a much more successful company. So so it's it's always like that, you know. And uh, and and that really comes down to the very essence, you know, of of um, of, um, of that personal relationship thing. You know, it's really about um, it's really about a relationship. You. You, you look at people, you see how they behave. You know, I'm, I'm always trying to, to find out whether, whether people will, will, uh, you know, will put through with the task. Um, uh, there was a reason why, you know, when Mark Johnson was here yesterday, he talked about the, uh, the startup roller coaster. It really is a roller coaster, and the question is, can people, um, can, can people ride that roller coaster? Can they, can they not become excessively crazy when things are going good and the next day not get depressed when things are going bad. And this is actually um, one of the, I find personally, one of the hard things with, um, uh, you know, with investing in our times, especially in a place like Southeastern Europe where it's very new, there is a certain hype. And when there is a hype, there's, there are always a bunch of people that generally wouldn't do something, but they do it because they follow hypes, which is absolutely fine. I'm not judgmental about it. But the, the truth of the matter is there are a lot of these people that, uh, sometimes very successfully pretend to be entrepreneurs. Um, I'm not saying they cannot be good entrepreneurs. Maybe this is the first step for them to become a good entrepreneur, but they definitely do this you know, out of, uh, out of certain group pressure. And rooting out them is, for instance, something that you do uh, as an investor, inevitably. And that's, that's one of those things where you know, something may seem like a really, uh, really interesting idea and the team is actually good, but I'm always trying to see will these people execute. So that's you know, coming back to the execution point. Um, as much of it as possible. Is the better. Okay, if there is, um, this is the last opportunity to, to ask a question or share a story. If there's no one, uh, if there's no one who, uh, who has anything to share, uh, I thank you very much. Um, these are my contact details. If there's anything you guys want to follow up on, if there are any ideas or, or, or projects or, or stories you want to you wanna get some advice on or share with me, um, I'll try to answer everyone. So thank you very much. Thank you.